Is your understanding of history about to be transformed by this video? Who's to say? But we're certainly going to give it a try. It's an audiovisual collection of phenomenal archaeological finds from all over the world, ranging from hundreds to thousands of years old, and taking in cultures and civilizations that have been lost to time. Let's get going! A remarkable piece of maritime history is set to attract visitors once again as a centuries-old fishing boat, which endured a tumultuous journey through time, is prepared for public display. Unearthed near Giggleswick Tarn in North Yorkshire, England back in 1863, the intricately carved wooden vessel found its way to Leeds City Museum. However, tragedy struck during World War II when the museum fell victim to a devastating air raid in 1941 reducing the boat to 45 shattered fragments. Now, after meticulous restoration and reconstruction efforts, the boat will finally find a new home at the Leeds Discovery Center, where it will be showcased for the first time in decades. Kat Baxter, curator of archaeology at Leeds Museum and Galleries, expressed the awe-inspiring nature of the boat's journey, surviving centuries buried underground only to face destruction during the war. The restored craft serves as a poignant reminder of the profound history that lies beneath our feet and invites visitors to contemplate the legacy and craftsmanship of our ancestors. By appointment, visitors can marvel at the painstakingly restored fishing boat, gaining insights into the lives of those who once navigated the waters of Yorkshire. The Holy Robe, one of the earliest relics of the church, holds a profound significance in Christian history. Believed to be the seamless garment worn by Jesus before his crucifixion, it is a treasured symbol of faith. Allegedly discovered by St. Helena in the 4th century, the holy robe was entrusted to the diocese of Trier in Germany. Usually kept folded in a reliquary and not readily accessible, the holy robe has only been publicly displayed on rare occasions. In 1512, Emperor Maximilian I's demand to see the relic sparked irregular pilgrimages to Trier, where it is still kept. The most recent public viewing took place in 2012, drawing over half a million pilgrims eager to catch a glimpse of this sacred artifact. Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI spoke of the Holy Robe's profound significance, noting that it brings to life the final moments of Jesus' earthly existence and reflects the unity and indivisible nature of the Church. While the exact origins of the Holy Robe remain shrouded in mystery and scientific dating is lacking, its presence continues to inspire awe and reverence among believers. The ancient theater of Epidaurus, situated in the Greek city of Epidaurus, holds great historical and architectural significance. Built in the late 4th century BCE, it's renowned for its remarkable acoustics and aesthetics. Alongside the Temple of Asclepius, which was recognized as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1988, constructed by the architect Polykleitos the Younger, the theater offered a seating capacity of 13,000 to 14,000 spectators. It hosted music, singing, and dramatic performances as part of the worship of Asclepius, the Greek god of medicine. These shows were believed to have therapeutic effects on mental and physical well-being. Today, the theater continues to captivate Greek and foreign visitors, showcasing ancient drama plays during the Epidaurus Festival. Notable performances have featured prominent actors, including Maria Callas. The tripartite structure of the theater includes the theatron, orchestra, and skein, preserving its original Hellenistic design. The auditorium features two distinct sections divided by a horizontal corridor, ensuring optimal acoustics and viewing. With its more recently restored gates, the theater is still a resplendent sight and stands as a testament to the rich cultural heritage of ancient Greece. Archaeologists conducting excavation work for a natural gas line near Lima's central coastline in Peru have made a remarkable discovery that sheds light on the region's ancient past. Unearthed during the excavation was a 500-year-old funerary bundle and pottery believed to belong to the Yishima culture. The bundle, carefully wrapped in mats and secured with ropes arranged in a geometric pattern, contained human remains, various offering artifacts including mate vessels and ceramics. This finding provides valuable insights into the burial practices 
and material culture of the Yishima people. They were a pre-Inca society who once thrived in the region and later became part of the Inca Empire, known as Pachacamac or Pachacamac. Their kingdom encompassed the lush valleys of the Luren and Rimac rivers, where they established a well-organized and prosperous society. Despite occupying a desert region, the Ashima people developed sophisticated irrigation systems, allowing them to cultivate vast orchards and forests. Their high standard of living was evident in the abundance and variety of their agricultural produce. The discovery of this funerary bundle and pottery contributes to a growing body of archaeological knowledge in Lima and Calao. Zakimi Castle, also known as Zachimi Gushiki in Okinawan, is an ancient fortress located in Yomitan, Okinawa, Japan. Although it now lies in ruins, efforts have been made to restore its walls and foundations. In recognition of its historical significance, Zakimi Castle was designated as a World Heritage Site in 2000 as part of the Jusuku Sites and Related Properties of the Kingdom of Ryukyu. Constructed between 1416 and 1422 by the renowned Ryukyuan general Gosamaru, the castle involved laborers from distant places like the Amami Islands and used material sourced from nearby Yamada Castle. Its strategic location oversaw the northern portion of central Okinawa Island. The fortress boasts two inner courts, each featuring an arched gate. Notably, it is home to Okinawa's first stone arch gate, showcasing the distinct keystone masonry of the Ryukyu region. During World War II, the Japanese repurposed the castle as a gun emplacement, and it later served as a radar station for the U.S. forces. The installation of radar equipment led to some damage to the walls, which have since been restored. Restoring a ruin might sound like an odd thing to do, but it's better than letting it crumble to nothing. The Coronation Chair is a wooden chair that plays a significant role in the coronation ceremonies of British monarchs and was recently seen in the coronation of Charles III. Commissioned by Edward I in 1300, its purpose was to hold the Stone of Scone, a symbol of Scottish sovereignty. Edward brought the stone to England in 1296 to signify his reign over both England and Scotland. In 1996, the Stone of Scone was returned to Scotland, but it remains a part of all coronations. The chair was present during Edward II's 1308 coronation, though its involvement in the actual crowning is uncertain. However, it is known that Henry IV was crowned while seated in the chair in 1399. Since then, nearly every British monarch has sat on the chair during the investiture ceremony, where they receive the regalia and are crowned. Made of oak, the chair stands 6 feet 9 inches tall and is adorned with gold gilt animals, foliage, and an image of either Edward the Confessor or Edward I on the backrest. The chair has suffered damage over time, including graffiti from visitors in the 18th and 19th centuries and an explosion in 1914 caused by suffragettes, but it's always been repaired. The Bewcastle Cross along with its counterpart at nearby Ruthwell, is considered one of the finest surviving examples of Anglo-Saxon art in Britain. Influenced by the style of Northumbria, Rome, and Syria, rather than Galloway and Ireland, these crosses likely date from after 675, when the area came under Northumbrian control. Benedict Biscop, who brought masons from abroad to build his monastery at Monkwearmouth, may have been involved in the carving of the Bewcastle Cross. The runic inscriptions on the cross, although worn and damaged, are believed to possibly commemorate King Alfrith of Deira and his wife Cinebra. Speculations surround the erection of the cross, with one theory suggesting it was organized by Alcfrith's half-sister Abbas Elfled of Whitby. Others attribute it to King Edbert's reign. The three figures on the cross hold great significance. The top figure represents John the Baptist, while the middle figure portrays Christ as king and lawgiver, recognized by the animals at his feet. Below the long inscription is a controversial figure, possibly Saint John the Evangelist, depicted in a unique manner. Research has discovered a similar image of Saint John in a Syrian manuscript, suggesting a possible connection. The Thorsberg Chape 
a bronze piece believed to be part of a scabbard, was discovered in the Porsberg Moor in Germany. It is thought to have been placed there as a votive offering. Dating back to approximately 200 CE, the artifact features an elder Futark runic inscription, one of the earliest known examples. Archaeologists have traced the origin of the Torsberg Chape to a region between the Rhine and the Elbe. The runic inscription on the artifact is translated as Volfuthevas is well-renowned, or the servant of Ullur the renowned. The term Olbu denotes glory or glorious one, associated with the Norse god Ullur. The second element, Buas, signifies slave or servant. The reverse side of the inscription includes negative phrases and translates to not ill-famous or famous renowned. Alternative interpretations suggest the first letter may represent the rune Othala, indicating inherited property. However, the absence of possessive case and the presence of the rune Fehu cast doubt on this interpretation. The inscription may also have poetic qualities, potentially resembling an alliterative longline. The Torsberg Chape provides valuable insights into the early Germanic culture and language, showcasing the significance of personal names and religious beliefs during that period. The Comunian Rose is a significant symbol found in the rock carvings of the Camonica Valley in Italy. It features a meandering closed line that wraps around nine cup marks and can take various forms, including symmetrical, asymmetrical, or swastika-like. The meaning of the Comunian Rose has sparked numerous theories. Emanuel Anati suggests that it may represent a complex religious concept, potentially linked to solar symbolism and astral movements. This motif predominantly dates back to the Iron Age in Val Camonica, specifically from the 7th to 1st centuries BCE. While most examples are found in the middle Camonica Valley, including Capo di Ponte, Foppe of Nadro, Celero, Sito, and Paspardo, there are also numerous instances in the Low Valley, such as Darfo Buario Terme and Essine. Paola Farina extensively studied the Comunian Rose and identified three primary types. Interpreting the symbol, Paola Farina suggests that the Comunian Rose initially represented the sun and gradually evolved into a broader symbol of positive power associated with life and good fortune. Although commonly referred to as the Rosa Comuna in Italian due to its flower-like appearance, this name is a modern invention. The stylized Comunian Rose has become a symbol of the Lombardy region. The Nazca Lines in Peru are arguably the most famous petroglyphs in the world, but we know very little about who created them. One of the few things that we do know, though, is that those very same people also had a ghoulish habit of collecting human heads and keeping them as trophies. It was long suspected that the trophy heads were taken from enemies in battle, but a 2009 study destroyed that assumption. By studying trophy head specimens at the Field Museum in Chicago, USA, scientists were able to prove that the heads belonged to people who lived in the same place and belonged to the same culture as the people who collected them. Rather than battle trophies, the heads may have been kept as part of a practice related to ancestor worship between 1,500 and 2,000 years ago. Whatever the reason might have been, it seems that the heads were worn as accessories. Perhaps during rituals or ceremonies, the skulls of the heads have been pierced to allow a woven cord to be passed through them for this purpose. The treatment process used by these ancient people did such a good job of preserving the heads that many of them still have all of their hair after all this time. When you try to picture the way someone might go about building a boat 2,000 years ago, you probably imagine a team of people arranging beams of wood and then either tying them together or binding them with a hammer and nails. That wasn't always the case for the ancient Romans. As we can see here with this March 2021 discovery from Croatia, they sometimes screwed their boats together. The remarkable sewn boat is about 2,000 years old and was discovered beneath the waterfront of Porich. It's thought that it sank while close to an ancient pier at what's now the archaeological site of Porta de Mar. There are still a few wooden nails used in the construction of the wreck, but the majority of it is stitched together, 
Croatian archaeologists say it's the greatest discovery to happen in their country in the 21st century so far. The boat was found embedded in 16 feet of mud, which proved to be the perfect preservative. It's a small sailboat and was probably used for fishing. The planks on its outer hull are stitched together with ropes, with the occasional wooden nail attaching the outer hull to the inner frame. Archaeologists have long suspected that such ships existed, but this is the most complete example ever found. Is the St. Bellic Slab the oldest map in Europe? It's a hugely controversial assessment of the ancient artifact, but it might be accurate. The slab was first found in France in the year 1900, but was thought to be insignificant and was even lost for more than a century before eventually being rediscovered and examined more closely. It's that recent examination that's led to the idea that the Bronze Age artifact might be more than it appears to be. The slab is covered with inscriptions and markings that were previously thought to be symbolic, but experts now believe it's an accurate topographical representation of the River Odette and the area that survives it. If that's true, it's an incredible accomplishment considering the people who made it lived around 4,100 years ago. If we interpret the slab as a map, we can probably view it as an indication of the territory held by a king or a leader all that time ago. The fact that the slab was intentionally burned, broken, and then buried could, therefore, represent the conquering of the territory by another entity. That's all conjecture, though the idea that this is Europe's oldest map is quickly becoming accepted as fact. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching, and see you soon.